Hey guys, today I want to introduce you to Brian Bates of Bear Creek Organic Farm. This video you're going to see today is a series of edits from the original interview I did with him that I posted at fromthefield.farm last week. That video is an hour and 42 minutes long and it's long form interview and tour of the farm. These guys are absolutely crushing it. Brian has an entrepreneurial attitude that is similar to what you might see in venture capital or tech. The guy is a is a true entrepreneur and he doesn't think like a farmer and I don't mean that to degrade farmers because I'm a farmer too, but the way he thinks about systems and his business is unlike most growers that I know. He is uh, truly an entrepreneur and he thinks big and he's scaling his business. These guys do, they're on less than three acres of land. In fact, last year they were only on two and they did $410,000 in gross revenue. Now that really only leaves about 10% profit, but they pay all of their employees $40,000 a year. So the crew is paid very well and uh, he runs this like a business and there's five things I've identified that I want to go over right now before I just kind of leave it to Brian but there's five things that I've identified that he does that make them successful the first thing is they focus on relatively high value crops now it's a fairly large farm as far as market gardens are concerned it's just under three acres now of production and they grow things like garlic and tomatoes but the bread and butter does come from their microgreens and their salad greens. And Brian will kind of get into the details of those. The second thing they do is they have fairly low maintenance and scalable market streams. And this is they, because they've focused on retail markets and they're not having to go and sell all the stuff at farmer's markets. They're, they're, they're in market streams where they can leverage their brand power to scale the customer demand in all the stores that they're in. And they're in a small community. Potoski, Michigan is, I think it's like 6,000 people. It's a tiny, tiny area. And they're just moving this much product in retail. That's amazing. The third thing is they're doing year round production. This is a totally high tunnel based operation that is uh, doing a lot of these crops year round, particularly the microgreens and also the salad mixes and greens that they have in those high tunnels. The fourth thing is they pay the crew very well. So they're each getting $40,000 a year. And some people might say, oh, well, that's just a, that's a way to kill the business if you're paying people that well. Well, what I saw when I was there is a real consolidated team effort. You've got people that feel a sense of ownership on the farm and I think that creates a synergy on their farm that allows them to do things that many others wouldn't do in the sense that only the owner would feel the um, responsibility to take on certain tasks but Brian's got his crew doing all this and yeah there's pros and cons to that and he'll talk about that but that's the fourth thing the fifth thing probably the most important thing here is they're running this like a business. Brian says this many times throughout the, the interview, but he really takes this seriously and he thinks about it a lot differently than most farmers in the sense that they take on loans. They're, I think they were putting in another $400,000 of infrastructure just this year on the farm. They're scaling this puppy and they're really going for the gold. And you don't see that in farming that often. So those are the five things and um, you know I've visited a lot of market gardens over the years and I have to say these guys are the number one that I've seen as far as how you can scale a business, how you can grow a market garden and there's no benefactor here like they're, they're getting loans just like any other small business would, they're self-funding this and they're letting the market guide where they go. And that's what I really liked about Brian's approach was his totally market-driven approach. Amazing stuff. Um, you'll, you'll, you're gonna see it in this video, but Brian was 
the first person I'd seen do this Pac-Man style planting with Salanova with the paper pot transplanter where they basically plant a bunch of rows with no walkways and then you harvest it and you walk on what you harvested. Brian was the first one to do that and he demonstrates that in this video. There's a ton of value in these in this short video, but uh, if you are a member at fromthefield.farm, make sure to watch the one hour and 42 minute long interview I did with Brian last week. All right, guys, enjoy. Like, I, I'm very surprised to see what I did when I came in here. All these microgreens, like, as you describe the place that you're in and the, the demographic you're dealing with, <laughs> it's it's a, like yeah. you're moving a lot of product lot. that is fairly niche market product yeah. in a marketplace that I would not expect. Did you, when you were setting this up, yeah. did you have to do a lot of education to your customers to get people on board? Because I, I, quite frankly, I'm surprised that you've had this much success and you're moving this much production this early in the game, like only six years in. Uh -huh. How did you how did you find these customers? Are there a bunch of greenies that live around here that yeah. are into this or So I we run a very market driven farm. So we were not like we're going to build a farm around lettuce and tomatoes and microgreens and people are going to buy it and we're going to educate them until they buy it. That's yeah. not our approach. We had never heard of microgreens when we started our farm. But we wanted to start plants earlier in this greenhouse and we thought, "Man, the propane bill is really expensive." to start tomatoes for which you don't see a crop until July. Yeah. So we were like, maybe there's something we can grow this a little faster. Yeah. And we were at a farmer's market in the winter in Wisconsin and they were selling microgreens at the farmer's market. Okay. At this point we'd heard of microgreens, but as this really fancy niche crop, you know, fancy chefs, high end restaurants, but these folks were selling microgreens like straight to their customers. And we thought, well, that's interesting. They're selling what we consider a fancy crop to regular customers. And it wasn't dramatically cheaper, it was still pretty expensive. But this sort of light bulb went off. Now, I will say a light bulb went off. My wife will say she's been telling me this for years. That <laughs> is two versions to every story. She's probably, you know, she's probably mostly right on that, but I was just like, there's no market for it. Yeah. The mental switch was we thought we were gonna grow, and we started with two flats two flats a week, bring them to market, cut them at market, get people trying it. Four flats, yeah. eight flats. By the end of the first year, we were seeding like 60 flats a week. Now we'll seed 600 flats a week in the summer. Okay, so, but it's important, you know, I see a lot of people getting into the microgreens game. We did not start with 600 flats. We did not start thinking this greenhouse would be full of microgreens. Yeah. We started with two flats of buckwheat because which we don't even grow anymore yeah like it seemed like a good one so we started small and the big shift was we thought we'd be marketing it as like super nutritious this like super food marketing and our customers were like yeah that's cool but like there's kale and spinach too and the shift was it's convenience it's convenience food yeah you made your whole dinner for you and your family you forgot to add a salad or a vegetable put some microgreens on it yeah you were making a sandwich for lunch real quick. You've just got some deli meat, some mayo, put some broccoli micros on it. And so all of a sudden, you know, we started encroaching on like people who are already buying sprouts and, and talking, singing the praises of microgreens compared to sprouts. And then also just like if you're already eating baby greens saying, look, we can't realistically have a great selection of baby greens for four months of winter, but we can do microgreens. And so then we started marketing this as just like, basically like really tiny salad mix, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so so the vast majority, and I'm saying uh, in terms of pounds sold, probably 75% of our microgreens are going to individual customers. That's amazing. Not chefs. About half of our sales are to grocery stores. Now, talking to you now, yeah. almost 50% of our sales are to grocery stores. Okay. Okay. And so we are selling these in individual, you know, two ounce containers to the grocery store. Yep. And then 30% uh, of our sales is at farmer's market. We attend two farmer's markets a week, Friday and Saturday for four hours each, 52 weeks a year. Yep. So we go to the two markets year round. That's 30%, 50% grocery, 30% farmer's market. And then we do about 10% with restaurants mm -hmm. and across the whole year. So it's not, it's way more in the summer, barely anything in the winter. And then the other 10% is our plant sale 
like our our like yeah garden you know starts and stuff in the spring which is just a two and a half week flash sale in our greenhouse we people come out buy all their organic plants go home and garden with them and so it's like two and a half weeks wow yeah um, that's 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 it, really cool it's it, an insane two and a half weeks you know our town is six thousand people it's not a so, big area so who's your guys's market then yeah um basically our neighbors yeah so unlike so many market farms that we looked at and and like learned from and and worked on or whatever a lot of them were a small farm on sort of the urban or suburban fringe selling into a large area i'm thinking yeah. like twin cities madison wisconsin chicago you know philadelphia like all these sort of you're outside selling in yeah and our town is six thousand people our county is thirty thousand so we're not pulling from a huge amount of people we are in a summer tourist destination yeah so there's a bunch of people that come up you know up north for the summer so we have like restaurant accounts in the summer that buy things that no restaurant would buy up here in the winter I like see. they are doing higher end short-term cuisine and then they shut down yeah. so there's this sort of brief moment um but also we're in a very cold climate yeah. and so that's why we've doubled down on greenhouses and hoop houses because we figure those are never going out of style um we, we have a very cold climate and so being able to have that jump start on spring and grow things when people sort of expect it a little less often makes a big difference. The epicenter of the Pac-Man planting. Yeah. Do you do you call it that or did I, I just make that up? Okay, no, okay. I, I, I invented that term because people kept asking me how do you walk down? It's funny because like, I know. that's how I just thought about it. Yeah. I didn't I didn't hear you say Pac-Man. Yeah. I was just like, it is like the game Pac-Man, because yes. you're going like back and forth. Yes. Yeah, so um, this is this is an example of like you know, not perfect. Everything's not perfect. You're doing the same. We got some chickweed. Green sweet. Lots of green sweet. Hey? Lots of green that's, sweet. That's it's the, the fastest and the heaviest. And the, yeah, exactly. And yeah, we're just now sand. switching. We used to use that red incise, and we've just lately been switching to the red. Green sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you do the exact same ones as I do. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And so you can see there's some chickweed pressure in here. So Pac-Man or just densely planting, whatever you want to call it, the Pac-Man tends to be uh, more of a calculated risk in the spring because the weed pressure can be higher. Right. In the fall, which is when we started doing this, it's non-existent, it's flawless. And so yeah. most of the photos that we'll put on like our website online, <laughs> those are fall planting, yeah, yeah. right? And the spring is some weed pressure, but the other thing that we know about the spring is we're going to be either smothering or tilling right after. And so we just need it to basically be easy enough to harvest and then we'll deal with it. Yep. So kind of easy enough to harvest and then we'll deal with it. And then this tunnel was the first one planted. So we keep it minimally heated above freezing. Yep. And so uh, because we keep it above freezing, but below 40 at night, we moved as soon as we ran out of space in the greenhouse. The first thing we do is we take all the alliums and move them in here. So these are all paper pot trays of onions and four packs of onions. We move them in here because they, they don't need they don't need really warm temperatures yep. and we just kind of temporary space. Yeah. So just saw horses and purlin pipe. Wow. wow. Yeah. And uh, so once you are you doing multiple cuts on this or is it a in the spring it depends on yes we can. But lots of times we've got tomatoes that are busting to get in here. So we do one cut and then we start planting. Okay. With one of our hopes with building these new tunnels is that we are we'll do a little bit less of that and just getting a second cut will be worth a lot to us. Absolutely. So this one will be one cut because tomatoes are coming in as soon as we're done. The other tunnel of Salanova that we've got, that'll be two cuts. So this is like what you said about um, when this is cut, you come in with that, that auger and yes. you it's an auger hole. You don't care about the paper chains nope. left over, whatever. Nope. And you just till that stuff in, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. And so our early crops that go in are tomatoes and our slightly later ones are cucumbers and basil. So the Salanova tunnel that we'll get a double cut from, there's no rush because we'll put the cukes and basil in later. The tomatoes we want to get in ASAP. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so we have overhead irrigation in all the tunnels for when it's Salanova or spinach. And then we just run drip when it's yeah. tomatoes, cukes, and basil. Yeah, yeah, wow. Like the logistics of Bear Creek, how many people working 
yeah. maybe like how many beds of production are you on a standard 100 foot bed or because your tractor you're just doing long rows whatever right yeah um yeah just talk about i can some give of those. a sort of like by the numbers like breakdown yeah so, um full worker wise we're at about eight full time in the season uh yeah full time in the season and then the winter there's four of us full time and part of that is we have work and part of that is that's our core i'm counting myself in the four part of that is the the four of us are like the core management team and we we can do every task on the farm and so it's part planning going to conferences together giving each other vacation time so it's it's managing winter um and then we add like four in the summer so basically eight um on the high end people make like 21 an hour on the low end they make 10. 10 is just a short-term apprentice any full-time worker starts at 1250. yeah and um and then for that core team i've tied we we actually all agreed to tie our salaries together yep. so i make the same as them wow so if one of them wants a raise all of us need to get a raise and we go through the budget and look at what's possible so um yeah so we all make 40 grand a year plus bonuses and bennies so we do that um so that's the workforce and everybody's local so we're not doing like we don't have free interns from a field I mean, you know everybody's here even if they're an intern or an apprentice they're usually from here either in between high school and college or back for the summer whatever and then um all the other workers live here so we have no sort of out-of-state interns and we have no like h2a workers or any sort of migrant workers or anything like that so that's the workforce um and historically payroll's been about like 30 percent of our gross sales and our hope is that if we pay off some capital debts that number can creep up um we're not rooting for payroll to go up but it's one of those things where we really want to take care of our people yeah. and grow into our people and so you know i'm not looking at that and saying oh my god payroll's way too high you know we, we that's how we make money. Mm -hmm. I am on payroll. I get a check deposited into my account. It is not like an owner's draw whenever there's a bunch of money in July. It is very, very consistent. And it's hard to manage the cash flow so that we get the same paycheck in January that we get in July, right? That's Big really time. hard. So that's the that's the staff side of things. Uh, Growth-wise or sales-wise, we're growing. Last year we did like 410. So about like 410,000 gross sales yep and that was on like a little under two acres so it's pretty high value production but a lot of it's like you know greenhouse and hoop house stuff we have a quarter acre in hoop houses that's and that's pure square footage i'm sorry those. yeah it's almost more than that it's got to be more than that you got four big it's 16 17 000 square feet so okay. yeah, it's closer to 50 percent. It, yeah acre. it's almost half acre yeah. yep so that's in hoop houses and then this greenhouse is our only greenhouse it's 30 by 110 3300 square feet this is the only structure we grow 52 weeks a year in and halfway down we put up a temporary curtain in the winter so we're just using the front half and not heating any more than we need to yeah gross sales are right over 400,000 this year they should be right around like 525,000 something like that we've yep. grown about 100,000 a year for the last five years wow um and the field production is a really, really smart part of what we do. So we yeah. just put the beds where the beds go. Yep. And the field is basically just garlic is the dominant field entity. And our field production is basically always four times the amount of space garlic takes up because we're on a four year rotation. Yeah. So uh, this year we have a hack half acre of garlic. So we plowed some new area so that we have two acres total out there. So you've got a half acre for four years. You follow me? Yep. yep. So that's that. And then whatever is not in garlic is basically in Salanova romaine kale and some onions and that's field production you're running this like a scalable business we're trying to professionalize the field yep love yep. it yep that's the goal run it like a business i mean that and 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 treat it like a business get respect like a business and we've won some business awards from our local chamber of commerce cool. and things like that to me mean a lot because yeah. we're trying to do more than just be like grandpappy's farm like we're trying to make this a business with decent paying jobs people that can come to work and have a good job and it's productive so wow. it's felt really good yeah if uh, just and in closing where should people go to find out more about you guys instagram and facebook instagram for sure yeah. we're just at bear creek organic farm we post 
every day of the week, at least Monday through Saturday, 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Uh, we're pretty accessible. We try to reply to all the comments and you know get people, show people parts of the farm. Yeah. It's been we've learned so much from Instagram from other farmers. Me too. We love just trying to like put some more information back out there. It's a little bit of a weird hybrid marketing though because we're sharing stuff that's interesting to other farmers, but we're really trying to sell to our customers. So we're kind of always towing that line. So we're not getting into like soil tests and stuff like that, but we will show people things that are cool. Yeah. So it, yeah, Instagram has really benefited our farm. We love that. Do you do you guys ever bring like do you ever do tours or anything? Yeah, like that? so right. Oh, so I consult. Yep, so we have no farm stand, nothing like that, but we do monthly farm tours May through October. And that schedule's on our website and we've had people drive up here from Ohio and yeah. wherever just to come on a tour. And then, you know, we can if we got time we'll stay and chat with them or whatever. Yeah. Um but yeah, we do the tours every every month in the evening we rotate the day and it's just great it's just a fun time to go show people the farm and we have tons of field trips and regular things like that but um yeah you know you, we're in a we're in a new era where you have to you can't just do something interesting you need to show people it's interesting and then tell them why it's interesting yeah. and then do it basically every week exactly Hey, if you guys like that make sure to follow them on social media and i know brian does tours on the farm Check out their website. I have all the links below in the show notes. See you in the next video.